Hello, I'm Father Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Couch. We are Speaking from the Rooftop. A podcast in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. So grab a hot or cold drink and look along with us. But watch that road if you're driving. Let's go. Back in the mid-90s, we started a conversation from the rooftop of a seminary. In fact, what I recall is that we would have these incredible study sessions, being theology students at the time, and especially when we're preparing for exams, we would have topics, whether it's eschatology or the life of grace or moral theology or things of that nature. And then what often happened is when we finished the study for the particular exam, our conversation just kept going. Yeah, well, probably because I needed more time to ruminate over the topics <laughs> because I was lacking confidence in my ability to be able to perform on whatever exam we had. But there was also an, another another motive. I, I wanted to know how this affected real life. This wasn't mm-hmm. just academic. And as happenstance had it, we just began to walk out onto this rooftop to continue our conversation because our brothers would go to sleep and we would just slip through this window that on this tower that we had in our seminary and bring a couple of lawn chairs and sit out there and talk. It was fresh air and you began to look at the world and say, what does all this mean? What do we make of it? So. It, it was, yeah, it was out of consideration for them, but I think there was a tiny bit of excitement of breaking the rules a little bit and climbing, <laughs> climbing through windows and up ladders and reaching the parapet, if you will. But it was a beautiful scene. We looked out over the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, the Basilica there. It was lit up. The dome was lit up. It, it was Catholic University adjacent where all the campus could be seen in these beautiful old buildings. Uh, it created quite an atmosphere. And we could look out upon D.C. in different directions toward the Capitol Dome, toward the White House and Washington Monument, or uh, directly in front of us was the shrine itself. Mm-hmm. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself when we would finish preparing for exams that a certain kind of fear or trepidation began to grow in me because we realized we were going to be ordained soon. And what did the things that we learn have to do necessarily with the persons that we would one day serve. And so wanting to be able to apply the theology as opposed to just sort of memorize the theology, certainly it had great impact in our own life relative to our spiritual life, etc. But were we going to be able and adequate to be able to explain this to persons and to be able to have the faith be something that would actually engender in them um, discipleship? In a certain sense, the, the setting... Uh, without us knowing Mm. at the time, was perfect for this disposition because we were looking out. We were looking out at the world. We were looking out at the people. We were looking out upon uh, the things that were going on at the time. And we were trying to see it all in the light of faith. And of course, we we were focused on our own vocations and our own particular paths as that's what we're supposed to do in the seminary is try to figure out what God is doing in our own life uh, so that we can serve him in the church and the people uh, in the church. But at the same time, uh, we started uh, discussing matters that were even beyond our own particular path, starting to look at the bigger picture and what was going on around us. Absolutely. I, I remember, too, that what usually happened in terms of winding the conversation down is that we would climb as high as we could, not on the roof. We were already as high as we could on the roof. But we would begin to climb as best we could with our minds, to see how far we could go on a particular topic and to penetrate the reality as as acutely as we could. And at some point, we just sort of stopped and would look at the thing, almost in a sort of stupor or or marveling at something in a kind of wonder with the realization that we didn't have any more handholds. We couldn't actually climb any further. And so that would would end in a sort of silent um, gaze, as it were. And then we would just kind of peel off and go to bed sometimes to my chagrin way too late for me i'm not a i'm not a uh, a late night guy i'm an early riser and, and uh so sometimes it was detrimental for the next day but nevertheless i never found it to be um lacking in great worth yes well i mean it wasn't that hard 
to get you to stay a little longer. <laughs> it was pretty easy, actually. But, you know, I mean, we, we not only had some really great ideas, some illuminated ideas, some ideas that have carried with us throughout uh, well over 20 years mm-hmm. now, such that we can even say that we've been having the same conversation for 20 plus years. That's right. Um, we had really dumb ideas, too. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> not the least of which was the time I saw this um, antenna this like big bulky antenna. Back then, we didn't have any sort of internet or any cable uh, in the seminary, but you could have a television. So I had a small TV in my room, and I decided I'm going to hook that antenna up to my TV. So I remember I dropped the wire from the antenna down to my television, plugged it into the TV, never once considering the fact that I have just hooked up a lightning rod directly into my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> It was safe to be on the it rooftop. Was colossal, exactly. <laughs> it was colossally stupid. But 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 on the on the and the world of ideas and the world of exploring. I mean, we 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 learned a lot, and mm. uh, we've been able to um, uh, be able to explore the depths of things. And even though we reached uh, certain points where we thought we couldn't go too much farther, um, we knew that at some point we'd be able to return to those paths mm-hmm. and discuss them even further. And I think that you and I over the arc of time, started to realize how differently we would approach topics. And we really appreciated that because uh, the angle at which you were coming was slightly different than the angle, or maybe even substantially different than the angle at which I was coming. But we would always move toward the same place, but we would get there more quickly by talking to one another, by learning from the approach that the other one was taking. I remember, too, that even when we had to leave Washington, uh, because you were ordained a year before I was. And when you came down to my ordination in Charlotte, I recall that um, the night before my ordination, all of our priest friends were there. Remember, we had that, that we, my mother rented a house on the lake for all the, all of our priest friends. And, and uh, my dad kind of got us all set up and, but not realizing that we had more priest friends than we had beds. And so at some point, getting everyone settled down the night before my ordination, I realized that I had no place to sleep. So I went out to the dock and I thought I better spend some time in, in, in prayer. Tomorrow is the, is the big day. And eventually you came out because you didn't have a place to sleep either. And that conversation that had begun on the rooftop uh, ended up becoming a dock talk. Um, and we got into such an intense conversation about what it meant to offer the Son of God to the Father in terms of the Holy Mass. And it so moved me, our conversation, that I remember the two of us kneeling down there on the dock and just praying and realizing that the sun was coming up uh, at some point. And maybe not the best idea before one's ordination to stay up all night, but it, it certainly was something that I do not regret. Well, you have a much better memory than I do. I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe you fell asleep on me. <laughs> I was probably what you thought was prayer. Um, you might have noticed some snores, but uh, you know, it was yeah. In these moments, have 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 been just a continuation a continuation of our conversation, and you know, and the image of the rooftop is really appropriate, right? I mean. We're looking out uh, in much the same way that shepherds of the church are supposed to look out and to see the lay of the land, see where the challenges are, see where the difficulties are, where the, the, the beautiful currents that are emerging, and to look at them in a very smart way, in a way that uh, we're meant to, right? So we go off to seminary. We are studying philosophy and theology and scripture because the average person can't spend that much time doing that type of academic work in the world of the faith. And 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 we're supposed to then take that knowledge, to take that insight, to look out prayerfully and discern what's going on. And so uh, that that image from the rooftop has really stuck for us as, as really what, what we continue to do, even though we're not always outside on a rooftop. And all of those discussions are the things that fed our catechesis, fed our preaching, etc. And so we had said it to ourselves at one point on that rooftop, someday we might be in a position uh, to spend some time and actually invite other persons into our conversation. That someday we might have a radio show, back then it was a radio show, um, now it's a podcast, um, and we'll actually invite people to see if they want to come and spend a few moments with us and join our conversation. To be as fascinated as we are about our <laughs> own conversation. <laughs> there may be one of you out there. That's right. Uh, but we're glad to have you. So I remember at the time I was in um, an assignment, a pastoral assignment in Northern Virginia. And there was, uh, it was a very affluent parish. I mean, the blue collar worker was the attorney and the physician. 
Um, everyone else had, you know, castles in Europe. So uh, it was quite an experience for me. But I was at a reception one time at the church, and I was having a conversation with a, a person there. And this gentleman was asking me about my education. So I explained about my education in chemistry in, in undergraduate school and graduate school, and then talked about the philosophy program and then the theology. And, you know, when he when he added it all up, he looked at me and said, why does a priest need to be so educated? And I remember at the moment, at that moment being just dumbfounded. Like, I didn't know if I should be insulted. I kind of was insulted. Uh or, or just baffled by the question. And and so uh, the, I got over the insult pretty quickly. I don't remember what I said at the time, but I, I ruminated over why I was so baffled by the question. And really it comes down to the fact that, um, you know, priests are dealing with the um, the intimate worlds of the faithful. Uh, we're helping to guide whole lives and souls to make their way through this world to reach eternal life. And if you think that you want to leave that to a person who doesn't have education, then you don't really understand what it is that we're trying to do. And I think that that's what we're trying to do, at least, uh, you know, in this in this podcast, in this conversation, is to say, hey, that we want to follow through with why you sent us off to seminary to help you see what we can see by virtue of that knowledge and education. That's right. So what does not just right reason bring to a situation, clear thinking and right reason as best we can, but also then the light of faith, because the light of faith is going to give that much more uh, luminescence to the things around us in the world and such that you see things with greater clarity. If you take a painting for example, in a dark room, you're not going to necessarily notice all the fine lines and even its imperfections. But if you bring it out into the sunlight, you're going to see what the artist was really up to. And that's kind of what we want to do, is to be able to see things, not just f with right reason, but also with the light of faith, to manifest to you the, the brush strokes, as you will, uh, of the artist who is, the, who is the, the provident artist of all of time and history. From which to speak. So... That notion of the rooftop, uh, not only because we actually happen to be doing it in Washington. That was rather serendipitous. Serendipitous. Uh, and the, the text of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, 27, where our Lord says, what you've heard whispered, speak from the rooftops. That is to say, the Gospel. And so our intent is simply to take things as they come and look as a shepherd would look from a height trying to see from the watchtower of both faith and reason as we encounter things in the world and hopefully it would be of some benefit to you, the musings and ruminations that we have and conclusions that we draw. You know, that really is one of the roles of the shepherd. Uh, when we look at uh, the Old Testament, which really fleshes out uh, what we believe in the New Testament to be the role of a shepherd. You know, we talk about the, the role of priest, prophet, and king. And together, those biblical terms form the concept of shepherd, uh, the priestly sanctifying role, the kingly governing, leading role, and then um, the prophetic, uh, which is that teaching role. And all together forms an image of shepherd that Christ fills as the good shepherd. And subsequently, uh, every bishop and everyone who has care of souls, priests, uh, follows in that in that pattern of being a shepherd. And so it's a really important, I think, incredibly important part of fulfilling the role of shepherd is taking the moment to go up at a height and to look around and see what we're all, you know, what the context is, mm -hmm. what we're all up against, what the world is, what the lay of the land is, the moment in time in history. I mean, I think what the, the Second Vatican Council talked about, um, you know, reading the signs of the times. In many ways, it's similar. Um, uh, but it's not just about catching a few high uh, thoughts or currents, but actually really looking at the circumstances and considering God in that context, considering people and their real life circumstances in that context, and, and then the, the, the world around us. 
and uh, what challenges uh, we're facing and what beautiful opportunities and uh, the situations that we're finding ourselves in that maybe we never really found ourselves in before or maybe they're just rehashing things of history that are re- that are playing out yet again but with slightly different colors and hues. Yeah, and it's the, it's the nature of the current milieu to move so quickly from one context into another the same way um, commercial or a film clip would would move from frame to frame so fast and so what we want to be able to do is to some degree a bit of a freeze frame and to be able to examine something in in a little bit of a depth as opposed to it just passing us by we've heard these words before we've heard this text before this this um, gospel passage relative to the thing that's going on in the world we want to pause um, in in this podcast a little bit and slow down the purposes of seeing things anew. The same reason, the same faith, but looking at it um, freshly, if you you will, and to do so with the things that are coming at us that perhaps we haven't experienced before, but asking the real questions about what does the faith and reason say about this relative to God, the world, people, situations, etc. G.K. Chesterton once said that, that to look at something for the thousandth and one time, you you tend to look at it as it were for the first time. So that's what we're going to do. He was brilliant. Things. He was brilliant. Always popping things on their heads oh. and looking at them upside down. Even, the, sure even just <laughs> the concept of a color, right? Yeah. You know, just the, the idea of a color. And you'd have you look at colors differently. Um, and uh, yeah, he was just so brilliant at doing that. Yeah. And there's so much to be gained. Um, so much to be gained for it, or Absolutely. rather from it. So, all right, well, uh, spinning off then on our primary purpose of kind of taking a look out uh, from the parapet or from the, the, the um, what did you call it? The tower. The tower. Or from the tower. Ezekiel's watchtower, we'll call it. All right, Ezekiel's rooftop, watchtower. We're looking at it from the tower. rooftop tower. It's kind of looking at things. And right now, the most um, you know, glaring thing happening in the world uh, is this conflict in Eastern Europe where you have uh, Putin leading Russia into an invasion into the Ukraine. Now, at this moment, we have no idea how any of this is going to resolve. We certainly have an appreciation for uh, the, the geopolitical drama that's unfolding. But, you know, I, I have been struck from my perspective, not just looking at the context as a historical moment, but looking at it from the perspective of, of what's going on with God in this moment, what's going on with people in their hearts in this moment. And I can't help but to come to two different things that are going on in me internally. One is my mind goes back to Fatima. Mm. I just have this this sense um, of maybe something is unfolding that's related there. Because, as you know, uh, she asked through the children, as she appeared, Our Lady of Fatima, in 1917 to these children to have people pray for the conversion of Russia. Um, and we've seen so much happen Oh, in John Paul II's pontificate and the fall and the collapse of the former Soviet Union and the immersion of the country of Russia. And now we find it ourselves as kind of a new chapter, uh, it, but it's still all unfolding. And so I wonder to what degree all this is related to the events of Fatima and Our Lady's asking for prayers uh, as we now ask all of our parishes and churches to pray for this situation between the Russia and Ukraine. And then secondly, I think I think of how dangerous Ideal ideologues are like I, I look at a leader, um, you know, like Putin, and I, I I think to myself, is this man an ideologue? Because ideologues are da- I think they're da- they're fundamentally dangerous, and and of course it's not just a problem for world leaders; it's a real problem for people in general. Uh, to become an ideologue is 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 I think uh, a, a real disaster. Uh, for a person in their life to follow that path. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about either well, of those things? Just a couple. I mean, firstly, I, I'm surprised that that there's been such a connection with Fatima um, because I frankly didn't think about it myself because I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really think about um, uh, Russia being converted in any way, shape, or form by, by, by Putin uh, invading you know, Ukraine or his work in Belarus or his working in, in other areas. Um, 
obviously it's got to be connected somehow. But I've had so many texts from people asking me that question. Father, is, is that this right? it? And so there is some sense among the faithful. I'm ashamed to say it wasn't among me. Um, <laughs> that there might be something going on here. And I don't, I don't know. I, I do recall growing up as a kid saying the rosary in our parish. And we always said these prayers at the end of the rosary when the parish was saying the rosary commonly for the conversion of Russia. Yep. And I remember thinking to myself, what is Russia? Because I right. had no idea. You know, I was right. a kid. Um, I probably came closest to understanding at least the American image of Russia by watching Rocky IV or something. Or Red Dawn. It's where the, play- the players were, exactly. <laughs> um, but I had no idea back then. But it, it did strike me as the fact that the whole church is praying for the conversion of one place. And obviously that can't be for nothing. Why, why Putin? Why, why this time period? And as far as ideologues go, I mean, how would we define an ideologue? I mean, I suppose one could say that someone who, who, who thinks very myopically um, through one particular idea has a dialogue with himself um, and is intent on fulfilling the end that he has in mind and there is nothing else that's going to interfere with that. But I suppose it could also be the case that we encounter ideologues relative to persons who just sort of outsource their own thinking. In other words, you you don't want to think through things or make distinctions and so the temptation can usually be to choose your teachers, which we all do on some level, Mm -hmm. but then to choose them and then just have them (laughs) do all your thinking for you. Right. Well, you know, I think when I think of an ideologue, I think of someone who has a a particular view, as you say, a certain uh, idea, and it is fundamentally true. And therefore, in in one's mind, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't I, the problem is when it's not actually true or only partly true but to them it's 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 just fundamentally true and any information that comes in that suggests the contrary is somehow wrong mm. so this thought or this idea is impervious to new information or correction right right um and that's 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 really dangerous Absolutely. i mean um it, it lacks all nuance and distinction um you know, St. Thomas Aquinas loves to, the, the Dominicans love to say, you seldom affirm, you never deny, but you always distinguish. And that means that anyone with whom you're having contact, um, you walk through, like, we, like we're doing from the rooftop. The whole point in us doing this is we found that we could climb a little bit higher with two minds than with one. Because really with one, one mind, you're just having a, you're having a dialogue with yourself. Mm-hmm. And so you're sort of answering yourself the entire time, right. which is kind of another idea of an ideologue. Because there's That's no one true. to push back against your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can keep talking to yourself all you want and affirming your own ideas. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I, 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 I tend to find with that temptation to, to ideology in that sense is that even if new information comes, you simply shoehorn it into the idea that you already have so even if you accept it right. it becomes part of the the under the umbrella of the one idea that you have the man of one idea that's right you, you make it fit um, it makes you make it fit you make it fit you um, shoehorn it you know in a certain sense i, I mean i've fallen prey uh well, not all have them. <laughs> I, you know, but i'm going to take it you know into sort of a a silly non-significant realm but you you know you know you know i like metaphors and analogies um and so you know, I'll come up with an image of something Mm. and I'll say, it's like this and I'll draw some real parallels, but at some point you recognize I cross a line (laughs) and I start, (laughs) I start forcing parallels or drawing, you know, inferences that maybe aren't real. Um, and so I go too far and in a certain sense, I'm, you know, in this small way, I'm using this 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 metaphor, which mm. is always going to have some degree of similarity and a great deal of dissimilarity, mm. and I can blur the lines because I'm so enamored with the similarity that right. I, I'm not right. I'm not quick to stop at the dissimilarity. Um, yes, and so I can become a you know a small version of an ideologue relative to that image. Mm. Um, but I but but it is a problem. It's not just for um, geopolitical figures. Right. Uh, leading nations it's, into conflict. It's me. <laughs> it's me. I mean, we all have this drama with ideology. I mean, how often do we, you know, have we had conversations, whether it's someone who is coming from a totally different faith or a totally different uh, worldview, 
and you take a, a an issue that people have strong opinions about, whether it's a pro life, right, abortion. You can't you can't talk to them, mm. right? Because there is a there is this ideology uh, that's usually uh, manifests in a bunch of slogans mm -hmm. that are, it's impenetrable. It's impenetrable, and that's not a problem of mind. You know, that's a problem of will. Mm. And this is the difficulty with with any of us when we become ideologues. Because there's, there's one thing to teasing out a, an analogy and, and attempting to get from the analogy every possible drop. Right. And, you and are, I'm guilty. You are the I'm the that. worst. Um, I need you there to tell me when I've crossed <laughs> over a line. <laughs> yeah, but you're the master of images. So it's, it's helpful because you do come up with analogies that are extremely acute and penetrating. Um, and very helpful to understand, to bridge to bridge from the abstract to, to the sort of the concrete. Um, but as, as we say, all analogies limp. And when the limping happens, you've got to, you know, you've got to switch it to, to another analogy or what have you, or some other kind of uh, rationation to get more out of this topic. But nevertheless, it's, it just seems to me that every time we, we sort of bunker down in the slogans or the cliches or the, um, the camps, what we're ultimately doing is, is, is putting the covers over our head, and that's a, that's just a matter of will because the mind doesn't have the problem. Mm -hmm. right? the, the the mind doesn't have the problem looking at something and seeing the truth. Um, it wants that. It, it naturally gravitates toward that, and it shines light on things. It, it wants to know, whereas the will, I want what I have embraced, and I I don't want things the contrary because it will mean. A decoupling and an embracing mm -hmm. of something else. You don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be or, wrong. Or I want this to be true. Yeah. So I just, I need to say that if you hear heavy breathing, <laughs> it's not me. Uh, we have two uh, great Danes that are here in the room. They, they're they the seminary dogs. They're enormous, uh, but they think they're lap dogs. Um, <laughs> but when they sleep, they tend to... <laughs> They, they tend to be as loud as, you know, any one of us. They're not ideologues. They're not, definitely not ideologues. <laughs> they, oh, there we go. There we go. But I don't want anyone to hear those sounds and think, oh, is Father, is Father Winslow falling asleep? Well, I, was, I, was, I was talking too long there. Do you remember that time? <laughs> remember that time? But, okay, so we were, what you need to know is we, were at, we had the, the blessed experience of having a couple years overlap at a parish. And we had a lot of fun with that because we were longtime friends. Obviously, you know, we met in the seminary. And uh, we've you know, became priests within one year of each other. And then we really began our began our priest life at the same time. So to have this opportunity, you know, some 15 years, you know, maybe 12 years later, to land in the same parish, uh, working with the same people, um, was really a, a blessed moment. So we had this familiarity, we had this banter, and from the pulpit, uh, we would occasionally, <laughs> you know, uh, rip on each other. Uh, yeah, it was sort of, in fact, theme. the people loved it. I mean, it was a lot of fun. It would go, this sort of banter back and forth. You know, I would, you know, say things, all right, how long did Father Cal, you know, bore you, bore, you know, bore you last week? I mean, um, I mean I, you know, was, I'm sure it was incredibly tedious and boring and probably misinformed you with half of the things you learned. Uh, and I could do in half the time, you know, just simple like jabs and jokes and people, they loved it. They went on with it. And, um, well, one time there was somebody, we had visitors for Christmas and I got a letter in the mail to me as a pastor that was very upset in defense of you <laughs> saying that he had never been to a parish where a one priest spoke so harshly and meanly about another. And I was <laughs> thinking to myself, how could you not understand uh, yeah. it? But the whole room was... laughed. I mean, I'm funny. Yeah. I'm funny. <laughs> and that was funny. And <laughs> these people laughed. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just well, we found a common. Maybe you couldn't a, hear the laughter. A common uh, punching bag when Father Christian arrived. So yeah. we both. Well, that was easy because it was huge easy. target, big target, big target. Preached way too long. Way too long. Um, so he was fun. He was fun to. Oh my heavens! See. Well, that's true. That was a nice foil. But yeah, so, <laughs> so the um, there's a, you know occasional banter. How did I get off on that? We're talking about falling asleep with the dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not beyond me to fall asleep while Father Kemp talks. Well, and it, make was, fun it, of it was usually the opposite, though, because when oh, I was no, at the parish with you, I had, I had the high school as a chaplaincy and then oh, I taught yeah. at the Abbey. And then we were starting the seminary project. And so I was, I was shifting gears too much. And by the time I finally got home, 
you were kind of ready to go and to have conversation. And yeah. I was I was becoming an old man. So oh, I would yeah. pretend to listen after a certain point and you'd be talking and like, Cal, are you listening to me? <laughs> and you never were. And those recliners, they didn't help. Yeah, the problem is recliners are from the devil. So close to And it wasn't bed. exactly the rooftop. That's true. More... <laughs> we needed some cold air. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was too easy more, to fall asleep. Pressing, but... Yep, that's the way it went. Well, so, I mean, I suppose what we're... To get back to the the initial topic, I suppose what we're speaking about here relative to ideology then is that sort of intellectual humility that we have to possess that I, I want to hear someone else. I want to I want to understand them. And of course it doesn't mean that we don't make right. distinctions or we don't bring them to faith or we don't disagree or as if everything once we understand each other is going to be somehow um, a happy marriage. On the contrary, it, it may not be, but, but but persons can always be received even if, if the thing that they hold is not received. Yeah, that's hard though. That takes an awful you have lot. To, you have to. You have to. You really have to hone that that intellectual landscape that we're constantly assembling. Yeah. Um, you know, we're we're constantly altering, or should be anyway. Yeah. Um, taking in new information and adjusting so we have a sharper Absolutely. parallel with reality Absolutely. but if if there's something about our, our intellectual landscape that we protect because you know we don't want it to be it's where i live it's where i live it means too much to me then i guess we really run into this problem with ideology mm. um and then uh, any new information that threatens that aspect of our of our uh intellectual landscape is opposed Mm -hmm. And you, you can't possibly make distinctions uh, because uh, something might be threatened around the mm -hmm. chopping block. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's a real problem. And I think, again, I go back, it's not just for geopolitical leaders in any given moment in history that lead to wars or conflicts. It, 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 this is problem everyday stuff. I mean, people, I, I'm sure people experience this, you know, at work or in their neighborhoods, in their families. I mean, I warn my... Um, you know, my parishioners, every, th every, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, you know, look it. <laughs> you know, try to avoid the contentious topic. Coming. Yep. You know, if somebody tries to bait you into some unpleasant conversation, you know, it's just, it's, it's not the day. Mm. You know, enjoy the family. Yeah, you know, and this is where the faith... Do it another day. Do it tomorrow. This is where the faith can so set you free, right? Mm -hmm. um, because if you're talking... I mean, Thanksgiving table may not be the case if so right. I don't hold the faith. Um, but if you're talking about one of the, the the doctrines of the faith that are always terribly paradoxical with other things you experience in life, right. like you you have to hold this A and you have to hold this B in some kind of tension because the the resolution of those two seemingly things that are contradictory find their resolution in something that is beyond your understanding. Um, so a, a mystery being that sort of incomprehensible certitude. So it, it sets you free to be able to talk about these things because you're certain about what God mm -hmm. has revealed. Um, and yet I have no idea once I, I, I hold that truth, all the aspects of that thing. I mean, it, it shines a light into the entire, um, if you will, the entire landscape of reality. And I, I can't see very far in it. So to be able to explore with someone, mm -hmm. having that truth that has been revealed as the, as the ground that keeps us um, uh, foundational in our thinking. It, it, I don't have to fight over the, the territory. I don't have to fight over the ground that I'm standing on. That comes with revelation. Right. And then once I'm, I'm standing there, we can actually have a conversation about what does it mean to be three persons? Well, and that's it. God. So you have to surrender the temptation to be an ideologue. Yeah. You know, I mean, I get it. If, if other people's problems are not your problems, then you don't want to have to deal with them. Sure. And so you keep your world narrow and, and say the Catholic faith fits very perfectly. Okay, all right, that's fine. Um, but if for some reason in your family or uh, in your workplace, there are uh, these other arenas that you don't deal with that start to now spill into your world, mm -hmm. um, do you just defend your comfortable space <laughs> and come at it like an ideologue? It's a real temptation yeah. because you just say, you just come at it and say, no, you know, this is yeah. wrong, this is right. Okay, I'm not, you shouldn't dismiss what we believe to be right and wrong, but I, I, I don't think that you take the posture of an ideologue. Yeah. I think it's the wrong way because one, 
your perspective will never ever grow. Your the intellectual landscape will never sharpen and grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it's it's from the other side of the equation. Somebody you're, you, you, with whom you're having a conversation, if they do the same thing, then you're just fighting. Yeah. There's actually no meaningful exchange. Right. Um, there's no uh, no distinctions that are are being made for the purpose of helping each other learn more. Mm. Uh, and I'm quite honest, I think I could have a conversation with just about anybody from an ideological position that for, well, not from an from from a worldview, I should say, not an ideological position, but a worldview that is totally contrary to my own. And I think I can learn something. I mean, did you used to say this about Saint Thomas Aquinas? Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's what, one of the reasons I so gravitated to him because he he truth was wherever he could find it right and would would assemble that into um his monum opus in the sense that this person said this and maybe they should have made this distinction but that is true what they said Mm -hmm. um and over and over assembling as it were the summa of everything he had learned Mm -hmm. um, but didn't think that he would stop because he was critique i mean (laughs) bringing aristotle yeah uh, uh, Very you know, to, to, to be to the, brought in to the milieu at the time to a, a Christian mind. I mean, right. he was secular, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's the way it was perceived. You know, if we were to go back before before we close up here to the original question, it intrigues me. We're talking about ideologues and intellectual humility and Fatima. Mm. The fact that Fatima warned about the errors if it were as you were as it were of russia and communism etc and didn't warn the geopolitical figures like Mm. she warned three kids that's right right and so when we feel sort of incredibly small in the face of these momentous world events and how, how do i understand what putin is doing what what ukraine is is rebelling against and and as if still being an ideologue you can't obviously place this side is perfectly good and this side is perfectly evil. I mean, it's, it's so complicated. Yeah. Um, and to make a caricature out of that for my own ideological, ideological position. Right. But going back to Fatima, that perhaps there's going to be um, a bit of a, a humbling effect um, mm. between these two at present warring factions, whether it's Russia and the entirety of NATO, I don't know. But ultimately, she didn't give the ground plan to the generals. That's right. She gave to three shepherd kids. Who then in turn was told to spread the message to the masses. Yeah. I mean to to the rank and file yeah. people. And it's truly, truly extraordinary yeah. because, you know, I think right now, and again I obviously in this moment in time, we have no idea how this is gonna unfold. We listen back a year from now and uh, we'll have a better sense of uh, how things will have right. unfolded. But right. Um, at this moment in time, it, I know that there are people that have been um, assembling in Russia to speak out against this incursion. And I, uh, something in me uh, tells me that it, it, this type of change has to happen from the bottom up. It has to happen from the people. And I do wonder if all those prayers to pray for the conversion of Russia was really mm. about praying for the conversion of heart of the, of, of, of the people to to see uh, the truth of the, the the truth of their situation the truth of what leaders are doing with respect to propaganda with respect to ideology and to say no and to maybe stop it because honestly if he doesn't have uh, the backs of the Russian people to stand on mm-hmm then this all stops. That's he true. falls down. That's true. And this, this, this tense moment dissolves. Um, and so that's a, uh, I, I don't, again, don't know how it's all going to play out, but uh, it does seem to me that just as Our Lady spoke to three children who then in turn spoke to the rank and file people of the world, that it, it seems to me that probably the answer lies right now in the rank and file people of Russia. Mm-hmm. And how this thing will unfold, and uh, you know, maybe this was part of the, the the spiritual fortification over the course of a century uh, to prepare for 
what happened with respect to the late 80s, mm -hmm. um, the role of John Paul the II and the, and the fall of the, the Iron Curtain, the conversion of Russia from a, a, the communist state to now finding its last gasps, hopefully, maybe, I don't know. Please, God. Yeah. And, well, uh, for our purposes, we, we the answer is the same as what Our Lady gave, right, in terms of penance, 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 mm -hmm. and the Holy Rosary. The Rosary. So we have much to pray for Without doubt, I mean, the rosary is uh, uh, a mystical weapon, the effect of which exceeds the sum of its parts. Amen. But at some point, we have to talk about why Francisco was going to do any purgatorial time. Well, that, I mean, <laughs> I got to know something about that. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm with you. That's a little terrifying. <laughs> we'll uh, put that one for another Yeah, for people who don't know that the little top. boy, Francisco, the visionary, uh, was told that he wouldn't go to heaven right away or... or uh, no. Unless but, he did many, many rosaries. Unless he did many, many rosaries, and what was he, nine? Um, you know, something like that. We explore so, that one in a different episode. Yeah, it's a little bit terrifying when you look into I'm that. I'm coming down from the rooftop right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting too real. <laughs> oh, oh, very good. Well, good. Well, great to see you. All right, we'll Bye. see what we talk about next. <laughs>